Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you to the uh, organizers of the, the conference for giving us an occasion to uh, present our work. Um, so like Hugo just said, our, our paper, is, is, a paper is entitled Manu MacFrench from Hero to Zero. Manu MacFrench is the name of a generic model, what Walter called a grand model, uh, we, which we called Manu MacFrench, which uh, means manuscript, modern, and contemporary French. There's a, a little bit of an explanation behind the name. Um, the paper that we present today, uh, so I'm presenting here, Thibault, my co-author, is lost in the trains in Germany, and some of our uh, colleagues are, uh, are on the next slides that we, we mentioned. Um, so the paper is about how we gather different data sets in order to train a uh, generic model for uh, recognizing French manuscripts. Um, and we are showing you also some experiments that we ran, which in some ways are similar to some of the experiments that Walter made uh, just before um, on how that can be used to be more efficient on smaller data sets. Uh, so like I said, um, we're not just two authors on the paper. We also have uh, Jade Norendir, Maxime Humeau, Baudouin Davory, Elsa Van Cott, um, Anaïs Mazoué, Margot Fort and Soline Doha, who were all uh, non-expert transcribers working with us to create data. And they were students at the Ecole des Chartes uh, at the time we uh, ran the experiments. Um, I think by now, like this is the, the second day of the conference, but uh, some of you have been here for four days. Uh, it's obvious if you followed several uh, presentations on HDR that uh, there is a great opportunity with HDR uh, to give access to collections of documents and manuscripts. Um, but there's always this problem of creating the transcription models uh, because they require data to be able to, to be trained and those data can be costly and complicated to produce. There's the question of the uh, encoding choices, the transcription guidelines, the, uh, just the expertise to be able to read those handwritings as well. Um, but it is nice to be able to, to rely on pre-existing models. This is one of the things that transcribers advertise a lot, the fact that there's already some models that can be used. Um, and with something that we presented yesterday, HDR United, we also show that it's possible to rely on pre-existing data. Um, in 2021, we had a funding uh, from uh, the DMAP, which is a, a Parisian institution, to fund two things. The main one was to uh, buy and build a, a server to host Descriptorium as a web application uh, to give access to researchers and students from the Paris area. That was the biggest part of the funding that, that was dedicated to buying the, the components. Um, and the second part of the object of the, the project was to produce training data uh, covering a period going from the ninth century to nowadays in order to generate, uh, create a generic model uh, for French and Latin manuscripts. Um, the CREMA project was complemented by CREMA Lab uh, to create more data on the medieval period. We actually ended up uh, I'm saying we, but they actually ended up creating a, uh, a reference manuscript, uh, reference data sets for medieval manuscripts, sorry, called Crema Medieval, um, and also some transcription guidelines for the transcription of manuscript uh, of that period. So the issue that we had uh, was that for the, the, the Crema project, for the second objective, which was to create this generic model, uh, we only had uh, 8,000 euros, which is a lot of money, but not that much if you consider the time scope that we had. So the question that we're trying to answer here is, what can you do with 8,000 euros, some non-expert transcribers? Well, what you do is you look for solutions to optimize your spendings. So we had three ways to optimize the, the, our use of the budget. The first one was to reuse existing data sets. Um, there are not many of them, but luckily since we had already started HDR United at the same time, we had a way to find more easily some data sets that would match our need. The other way is something that was mentioned in the question just before to rely on already existing public digital editions or even printed editions to already have the transcription and just uh, focus on the alignment. Uh, uh, an alignment task. Uh, and then the last one was to create our own data set. Um, obviously, I mentioned earlier that there's difficulties when you want to um, create those data. So the idea for us was to try to find a way to uh, produce the, this data in an optimized way, especially for um, examples of handwritings from nowadays. And I will explain uh, what we did a bit later. Um, 
before I go into uh, how we, we used some data sets, one very uh, important thing to, to cover is the, the transcriptions guidelines that we had for our, our data sets. Um, we are following a diplomatic approach, which means that we respect as much as possible all the specificities in the document. So that means that we don't uh, correct the mistakes in the text, the text, sorry. We don't resolve the abbreviations. Um, we reproduce as much as possible some typographic specificities and there is no uh, text normalization. I'm sorry for the typo in the, the slide. Um, so what that meant for us is that we could not just take a lot of data sets and, and mash them into uh, one single data set because we first needed to make sure that they were conforming to our transcription guidelines. Um, we found that there's three types of reusable data sets. I know there's five, but I will explain why um, there's five here. Um, so if you don't consider right issues, um, the first ideal case is when you have a data set where the uh, uh, abbreviations are kept, there is no spelling correction, where the images are available online. This is extremely rare. Uh, and here you, you understand that this is basically a transcription that corresponds to our transcription guidelines as it is uh, with images. Uh, the second case is when you have some abbreviations that are resolved, no spelling corrections, and the images are still available. So in the third case, you have the abbreviations that are resolved, spelling corrections, but still some images available. That is the, by far the most common situation where you, you have already some mismatch between the images and the text. And then the fourth and the fifth cases are just cases where you cannot reuse the data set. Uh, the fourth one is, it's exactly the same. You have a transcription um, that is not exactly the same as the original document, but you don't have the images. And the last one is, well, you have the images, but you, you don't have any transcription. Um, for the I told you that the first type of data set that you can reuse is very rare. We had only one like that. It was the Testament Poilu data set, which was a um, data set created through a crowdsourcing campaign um, led by the National Archive in France. So the Testament Poilu is a corpus of wills left by a soldier from the First World War. And uh, it's public, published, uh, published sorry, with images and TI XML files that encode all the transcription. It's very nice because it comes with metadata that allowed us to create batches where we rely on the department of birth of the soldiers to be able to cover a, um, the variety of the territory of the mainland France. Um, what we did is we exported the images and the text and then we uh, imported the images in Inscriptorium, ran a segmentation task, and then aligned the transcription with the images and adapted when we needed the transcription to CREMAS guidelines. By far, this data set was the easiest to harvest because the, data, uh, the metadata were stable and that's really something important in the, in the future. Um, another example that falls within the category of the, the, the second or the third uh, type of data set that you can reuse was the abrégé de description des arts. Um, for CREMA, we created several data sets that are called CREMA, MSS for manuscript and 18th, 19th. It's always the century that it covers and inside those data sets, you have different examples of handwriting from that uh, century. So for CREMA manuscript uh, 18, we had this uh, uh, manuscript that we uh, could reuse from um, an American uh, crowdsourcing campaign that was led by the Smithsonian. Um, it's a manuscript from the 18th century. Um, we selected 20 random pages that we manually downloaded. Then we manually did the annotation uh, using the same uh, workflow as earlier, which is importing the images and then copy pasting the, the transcription. For this one, we had to adapt also the transcription to our guidelines. Um, but in this case, there was uh, a variety in the practices of transcription because it resulted from crowdsourcing. So not every annotator had followed the, the guidelines um, given by the, the, the person responsible for the, the crowdsourcing campaign. We were working on French manuscripts, so I think we found ourselves in the same situation as Walter where there is not really many um, uh, other type of data sets that we could use, so we decided to create our own. And that data set is called Crema Wiki. So for those of you who know, I think it's, it's similar to what AM, uh, the IAM data set tried to do. Um, we selected random pages on Wikipedia, put them in a form with a blank space and just asked random people to, co to, to copy the text. 
Um, and then once the, the form were filled, we anonymized them, imported them in, in Scriptorium, segmented, and then did the transcription. And in this case, the transcription was much faster because even for those who were writing very bad, it was easy to read because we already had the, the text above that we could uh, use as a help for transcribing. In the case of this data set, what's nice is that there's no limitation to the reuse, uh, reuse of the data because it's, we're using Wikipedia, so there's already no um, uh, copyright limitation on the, on the content itself. There's no transcription problem also, uh, no ambiguity because we have the, the example of the text that people were supposed to uh, copy. And what's nice is that we have a varied vocabulary because we take random pages about asteroids, uh, movies, um, like lots of different things. And we have a great variety of handwritings. There's currently, I think, 200 people who participated. So that's a lot of uh, different examples of currently used handwriting for mostly French people. Um, in the end, for the, the Manu Mac French model, we were able to use this, um, all these data sets. So you can see there are several from the CREMA initiative. Overall, what you can retain is that we were able to reuse some data set that were signaled in HCR United. We were able to use some data sets that we created. Uh, we had a lot of French, a lot of data for the 19th and the 20th century. Although for the 20th century, there are still some issues with the, um, uh, um, not privacy, but the limitation on personal information. Um, we also included some printed documents and some Spanish and English on a very marginal uh, side. Uh, this is a recap, uh, recap of how we trained the, the model. We used Kraken to, to train this model. Um, I'm not gonna go over all the details, but what you can retain is that we reached an accuracy of 90% uh, or just above, which is pretty nice for a, a, a model that covers so many centuries. Um, and since there was a question before, we used a decomposed uh, approach for the encoding of the, the, the Unicode. Um, if you have questions on that, obviously we can go back on, on it later. Uh, this is an example of what it gives when we apply it to a manuscript from the 19th century that was not part of the, the data set. So it gives, um, overall it's readable. There are mistakes in it. Uh, if you look at the, the CR on the side, you see that the plain CR, we use our own tool which does a similar thing to Cerberus, so we have a, a, a nuanced CR that ignores the, the errors on the digits or the diacritics, et cetera, but the plain CR uh, was 13%, which is a bit high, but it's, when you read the text, you see that some words are uh, perfectly transcribed. Um, so it's pretty good can be better, but the point with HDR United, uh, with Manu McFrench, sorry, was not to create a generic model that people could use as is. It was more to create uh, a base for people to be able to fine tune it. Um, that's actually the kind of experiment that we ran. So a little explanation on fine tuning. Um, at the top, so you see you have your own data set that you can use to train from scratch on just your data sets and you will end up with a specific uh, model that can read only your hand the, the handwriting of your document in particular. In many cases, you actually rely on another uh, pre-trained model that was trained on other data sets and then you will just fine tune it on your own uh, data set to be able to reach a better result, um, which uh, means that you end up with a model that's Re relatively specific, but not exactly. They can just also use the, the generic knowledge that it learned before. Um, and you can also have purely generic models that are just uh, created with merging different data sets. We find our sit uh, ourselves in a situation where we, where we create quite specific data sets uh, fine-tuned on a generic model. Um, Manu McFrench being our fine-tuned model. Sorry, our generic model. Um, so here's some explanation on the experimental setup before I explain to you uh, which data sets we used. Um, so we used three different data sets. Uh, we split each of these data sets into different subsets to be able to run some experiments on the quantity of data. Um, and then we trained the model, uh, we fine tune Manu French on a subset of the data set, then a bigger subset, then a bigger subset, etc. and each time we have some metrics on the accuracy of the model. Um, we evaluated two things. 
the speed and the accuracy, so see how fast we can reach a uh, good CR uh, and also what type of CR we, we can reach. And we had a sort of baseline uh, that we created by using 90% of our training set, uh, sorry, on, on using the training set as the test set as well. So basically we were asking the model to recitate what was learned during the learning phase, which in theory gave us uh, an imbeatable uh, score because there is no way the model could go higher. So we use three data sets. The first one was Perrin. It's a data set from the 19th century from uh, a French uh, traveler. Uh, it's only one hand, uh, school paper, and uh, blue um, pencil. So it's very different from the, the type of um, handwriting that we had in the data set. Um, we use the Archive du Valais, uh, which is a, uh, a series of census tables from the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's only one hand per form, so it's a great variety of hands. It mixes a bit of German with the French, and it contain contains mostly um, proper names, uh, uh, job names, and numbers. And then we used another data set, the ENDP uh, data set, which was very, very different from the other data sets that we used to create Manumac French, because it's from the medieval period, the transcription guidelines were not the same. It contains many hands, um, but some formulas are pretty repetitive. The result that we get for the speed consideration is that for a pair, we just never reach a model that gives us good results. Uh, for Valet, we can see that, um, so let me explain how to read this, the, the chart. You have the accuracy on the side, and then at the bottom is the number of epochs, so repetition or iteration over the, the subset, and the different lines are just depending on how many subset we use, so how big the training set was. And so you can see that in the case of Valet, um, fine tuning is always faster than training from scratch. Um, let me find my notes. Um, and sometimes you have double the amounts, you need double the amounts of epoch to reach the same peak of training as when you train from uh, fine tuning. It can go up to three times more in the worst case scenario. Unfortunately, we lost the data for the ENDP uh, data set because it's, it, uh, uh, we were not able to rerun it because it takes a lot of time. And now for the accuracy, uh, what we can see from Perrin is that, um, so again, how to read this, this is not the epoch at the bottom, it's more, uh, at the bottom is the size of the data sets that you train on. So it's not the evolution of the, the score during the training, it's more uh, when you increase the size of the training set, uh, the accuracy that you reach. So you can see in the case of Perrin, we never reach a score that was even usable when we uh, train from scratch. It stays close to 0%. Whereas when we train uh, using Manumac French, we're able to go over 80% and close to 90%. And very close to the baseline that we defined at the beginning. In the case of Valet, uh, it's the same. We, there's a clear difference between training from scratch and fine tuning. Um, it's not as high as we could hope, but actually if you continue adding more data, you, find, you eventually reach uh, uh, close to 90%. And what's interesting in the case of ENDP is that at the beginning, uh, when you stay under 200 images, fine tuning from a model that doesn't have anything to do with the uh, data on your data set is actually pretty efficient to go over 80% until a certain point where since the transcription guidelines are very different, potentially the model starts being confused and then uh, training from scratch on only your model, uh, only the data for the, the ENDP data sets uh, even goes higher than fine-tuning the model. Um, I think I'm actually good on time. A conclusion. <laughs> so what we show with this experiment is that uh, open source data means that we can use, we can create massive models that are also open source, which is nice to advance uh, the situation of HDR. We show also that uh, generic models provide a healthy basis for training models and speed up the training to get better results, especially in cases where we have a small amount of data to handle with HDR. Um, it can also speed up training on what a human reader would consider a very different data set 
which is the case of the ENDP uh, data set. Uh, we see that instinctively we might not mix the two and actually it works to some extent. Um, and we have similar initiative to CREMA, not for the infrastructure, but for the creation of data, which are HTR Romance and Hterogen, um, which are two projects funded to uh, create more training data for uh, the med medieval and modern period and for other languages in French. Basically, we saw with CREMA that we have lots of data for the 19th century, and so we're trying to cover the, the centuries that are less um, covered by the current data sets. Thank you very much. <laughs>